How's it going guys? My name is Graham and welcome to Two Left Thumbs. With all the excitement today of announcing that Taika Waititi is supposed to be coming back to direct and write Thor 4, I wanted to talk about everyone's horse-based superhero, Beta Ray Bill. I've also been like itching to do another one of these videos. I did one for Shang-Chi, The Eternals, and Black Knight, all characters who are either having movies actively developed or at least in talks of having movies developed around them. I want to give people nice comprehensive looks at these characters to give them a sense of where they're coming from, what their powers are, their abilities, key stories that we've seen from them in the past, how they were uh, originally conceived and developed, and then maybe talking about how they might fit into the MCU. So those other three videos are entirely based on things that are either confirmed or more or less confirmed. This is the first one where there's zero confirmation. I'm kind of speculating. It's a character that's interesting, so why not talk about it? But I just want to be clear. Nowhere has there been any verified anything. Being like, Beta Ray Bill is coming. No, I'm. we're just hoping. I'm going to put a few timestamps off to the side here somewhere, and they will direct you around the video in case you're only curious about very specific parts. Some of this stuff might start to, like, bleed over into one another. So I'm going to try to keep the video quick for anyone who's curious enough to want the entire thing. Now, normally in these videos, I've talked about the movie news and rumors up top. I'm going to move that down a little bit because the rumors and news are entirely rumors. And I think the more pertinent info that maybe people are clicking on to look for is who the hell is this character and why should I care about Horse Thor? And honestly, if you hear the sentence Horse Thor and aren't interested, then I'm not sure I can help you but maybe this will give you a better picture. Now, in the comics, the character is a genetically engineered superhero created by the Corbinites that come from the planet Corbin. So he's not someone who gained powers through some nuclear blast or from an Infinity Stone or what have you. It was a race of a bunch of smart people who were trying to build their own superhero to protect them. Interestingly, they felt the need to build this hero after their home world was destroyed by Surtur. Now, we have met Surtur in Thor Ragnarok. Unfortunately, the character becomes more of a MacGuffin than a character, but we've seen him nonetheless, and we might get a broader sense of that character if they keep that origin in mind. When I show you pictures of the Corbinites, you should immediately be asking, why does Beta Ray Bill look like a horseman? They weren't just genetically engineering members of their own species. The Corbinites were taking various hostile species from around their planet, you know, the biggest, the toughest, it would be like the bears and the lions and stuff if we were doing it here on Earth, and doing experiments on them. They were cybernetically enhancing this thing, I believe making it more human-like, you know, like a, it has a human body. They were then going to translate one of their own's life force and consciousness into the cybernetically genetically enhanced monster or creature from their planet. This experimentation killed a whole bunch of the creatures, but these guys were like desperate, so they just kept at it. Eventually the series of experiments that works is the carnivorous horse creature and the individual Beta Ray Bell whose consciousness is transferred over. I'm going to do a section specifically on the inception and development of this character, and I can get into more specifics there. But broadly, this character was meant to be introduced as adversarial to Thor. He was a gross, weird-looking horse monster because they wanted you to immediately picture him as being the bad guy. For an extended part of his introduction, it's very unclear where he lies, and you're probably just going to assume he's a villain. As for his powers, he has very typical superhuman strength, durability, longevity, speed, all that sort of stuff. He's like nigh impenetrable and all these different things. Basically, he has the same power set as Thor, minus the control over thunder, electricity, weather, things like that. But his strength, durability, speed, everything like that is going to be identical to what we've seen from Thor. Not upon his original introduction, but eventually when he gets the weapon Stormbreaker, that grants him all those additional powers to the point that he is basically Horse Thor. Thor is considered to be one of the strongest beings in the Marvel Universe, particularly adept at hand-to-hand -hand combat, and they brought each other to a standoff in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He also has his own sentient ship, Scuttlebutt. Really, there's not a lot to be said about this character's uh, powers and things like that. It all comes from where the Marvel mindset was at when they wrote the character and how they introduced him and all that. That's kind of the more interesting stuff. I think a good place to start is how this character has almost been in the MCU a few times. They've kind of been dancing around with it for a long time. And seriously, if they would have brought in any other director other than Taika Waititi, I would have thought there's no way they're tackling this. I think he's just the right guy to maybe make this work. Ragnarok had Thor, Hulk, Hela, Valkyrie, Loki, and somehow he made the rock monster Korg one of the standout characters. Other directors have made things work, like people will cry in scenes that are led by a raccoon. But I think there's a balance that needs a little bit more humor to really sell Beta Ray Bill on screen, and Taika's the guy for it. He can be an insane monstrosity of the character and be the butt of jokes and everything and play the straight man now that Thor is loosened up quite a bit, and I think that'll work very, very well. Now, to cover this as quickly as I can, 
In these movies, we've already had repeated talk of the Nine Realms. It was crucially important to the plot of Dark World. You know, Asgard is a realm, Earth is a realm known as Midgard. Jotunheim is where the Frost Giants are from. Nidavellir is one of them where they go to forge Stormbreaker. We've had a whole lot of stuff going on with a whole lot of realms. The Corbinites from Corbin actually exist outside of the Nine Realms. There are planets and plenty and plenty else going on beyond the Nine Realms. But Heimdall actually still kept an eye on them because he's chill like that. He's a cool dude. <laughs> Before I said that Beta Ray Bill has been on the mind of the MCU for a long time, at one point during the Dark World, they were going to actually have Corbin and the Corbinites, and they had this uh, concept art that they put out that was of a Corbinite Marauder. I believe the idea there was going to be that when they destroyed the Bifrost, they kind of screwed over these outer worlds that were being directly helped by Asgard at that time, and you were going to have these rising factions of these Marauders and things like that, things were getting out of control. That could have been a very cool way to lead things, actually, is that those actions of destroying the Bifrost are actually what led to this inner turmoil within Corbin, and that led to the creation of Beta Ray Bill. They could still slice it that way. That's just not quite how it works in the comics. Through one particular storyline, Beta Ray eventually ends up with a lady friend, T. Asha Ra. That's written out as three, three separate things. There's a character that is T. Asha that has a speaking part in the first Guardians movie. Maybe she gets brought back into the mix. It seemed like a really weird choice to choose that as that character's name. But hey, in Far From Home, they brought back Box of Scraps guy. It's the same actor playing the same character like 11 years later or whatever that is. And I can't even remember if he had a line in Iron Man. So if that character is brought back, that is like one of the furthest back threads that we have. Another very quick small thing that's not actually Beta Ray's only love interest ever. At one point, him, Thor, and Lady Sif are like hanging out and he's just like... Pfft. I dig this girl, she's cool. We have not seen Lady Sif in so long. That would be really cool to tie that back in, bring back Jamie Alexander, which I always want to say Jason Alexander. Seemingly Marvel had forgotten about this character. I think she was in the first two Thors. She had a cameo in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Honestly not sure beyond that. There are murmurs of them maybe giving her her own Disney Plus show. Bill almost had a physical cameo in Thor Ragnarok, but he was cut pretty late in editing. It was unclear, but I, I think they mean script editing. It was before they were filming things or anything like that. Foggy stepped in and they just kind of had a feeling that if you don't have time to do the character full justice, then you should save the character for another time. The character has been like crazy highly demanded ever since we had the first Thor movie, so it would have felt a little cheap to just kind of have a small teaser without any idea of how to flesh the character out or where he would be going in the future. So rather than dangling that carrot, they just, they just cut it. But we do still have a kind of cameo of the character in the movie that people have pointed out a billion times. In the giant Sakaran arena where they hold that contest of champions, someone can fight their way up and earn the rank of being a champion, and they're honored by having a giant version of their face mount Rushmore onto the tower. We can see Beta Ray Bill's face there. So even if we didn't get the character in the script in the movie, it's clearly still on Taika's mind, and he's probably going to try and bring it back for a sequel. Around November 2018, the Russo brothers said that they had lots of talks about possibly bringing Beta Ray Bill into the franchise, into those movies. Similarly, they just didn't have a place to fit it. Infinity War and Endgame are really the culmination of all the existing characters. It would be kind of weird to just slip in this horse monster at the last minute. Maybe it almost could have worked that he stepped up and filled in the role while Thor was kind of down in the dumps. But I'm glad they avoided that because it gives Thor a more complete arc. Although interestingly, Stormbreaker, which Thor forges in Infinity War, is usually Beta Ray Bill's trademark weapon. Just throwing around all these names and everything. It's too much, too many syllables. But that's normally Bill's weapon. So it's kind of interesting that we get the weapon before the character like that. Maybe they'll entirely rewrite it. Who knows? Maybe they'll entirely reconceive Bill and use a different weapon. I have some ideas that I'll save for the end of how I think they could handle that. Marvel and Feige have specifically said they wanted to wait until after Far From Home was out to talk about what their next slate of movies is going to be. They're not going to announce whatever it was seven years in the future like they did for Infinity War and Endgame. But they are probably going to start giving us the next year or two or three of what they're planning to do with the movies and the new Disney Plus shows. San Diego Comic Con is on this Friday, July 20th, and so presumably by then we're going to be getting the next couple of years of the MCU kind of mapped out for us. While we're on the subject, we have Black Widow, The Eternals, Shang-Chi, Guardians 3, Thor 4, all confirmed, Spider-Man 3, Black Panther 2, Doctor Strange 2, Captain Marvel 2, all very, very, very likely. And so seeing what the full ordering of all that is going to be is going to be very exciting. Talking specifically about this character, one thing of interest will be how they choose to order those movies and shows. We can speculate a lot as is, that might add even more to the pot. 
Maybe he'll be first introduced in the Loki TV show. We can quickly get to know the character, get to know his origins, he can jump into Thor 4, an established character. Presumably Guardians 3 is going to be happening before Thor 4, and it remains to be seen how big of a role Hemsworth is going to play in Guardians 3. We have to assume some, or else that scene is quite useless. But I think one interesting thing they could do is that Thor is with them maybe only for Act 1. There's a little bit of a recovery process dealing with the fallout. Maybe they all learn from each other a little bit. Thor makes a couple new friends. But when we begin to instigate the conflict of the movie, we are similarly introduced to Beta Ray Bill. Something urgent has come up that's going to need the Guardian's attention. Thor has to deal with something that is much more personal to him that Beta Ray Bill is going to lead him away on. There you go, we have the fun dynamic of Thor kind of competing with Quill and all that for who's going to run the show and things like that. It'll be really funny and, and great, and then we can go deal with a more serious Act 2 and 3 resolving the Guardians conflict. And we are fully establishing where Thor 4 is going to start, and we have our two characters ready to get rolling. Well, I'm on the subject... Beta Ray Bill has been zero confirmed in any way, shape, or form. I'm just trying to work with the existing dots that we have and thinking of how that might fit together. So he's almost been in the movies multiple times. I think his inclusion in a Thor 4 is more likely than it has ever been. But whether or not he's introduced in Thor 4 or earlier is really going to depend on how that lineup of movies and shows is mapped out. That's my general thinking right now. So, talking more about the character's initial development. The character was created by Walt Simonson in 1983. A fun fact, he was originally supposed to be Beta Ray Jones, but Walt decided that there were too many Joneses in the Marvel Universe, and he went with Beta Ray Bill instead. First being introduced in the Mighty Thor 337, specifically trying to inject a, a new concept into a Thor title. Like I said before, the character was kind of designed to be a bit of a monstrosity. They wanted you to think he was a bad guy. You're going against those tropes of the typical masculine, rugged, handsome hero. The way the character was written was also supposed to leave things ambiguous and maybe lead audiences a bit to think he was evil. The most important thing about this character, and pretty well the entire reason he was written, is that Simonson realized that the inscription on Thor's hammer did technically indicate that someone else could wield Mjolnir if they were worthy. Something that has been explored a lot since, but by 1983 no one else had picked up that hammer. He also had the interesting idea of kind of explaining this away, is that it shouldn't just be a character who is the most noble who could wield the hammer, or else Captain America would be able to pick it up day one. The character needs a lot of different qualities, needs to be more dynamic, more three-dimensional. They have to be a character who is noble and honorable, but can also take a life. It is a war hammer. It is a weapon meant to kill. You have to have that balance of mind and heart to be able to take a life and know when to take a life. Beta Ray Bill's background through his genetic engineering and cybernetics was built to protect and kill, and he had the consciousness of a man who possessed those qualities, that heroicism, and the ability to do what needs to be done. His combination of all these different virtues are such that he was worthy. This is a very dramatic introduction to a character, it really shook things up, threw things for a loop, and he has since become a fan favorite character that people are asking for with every Marvel movie, where's Beta Ray Bill, where's Beta Ray Bill? And I honestly don't know if he was that popular back at the time, or if people have latched onto him since, and just thought it was funny that there was a horse Thor. That's a bit of context I'm genuinely missing, and I would be curious to know. If you've obsessed over comics a lot longer than I have, or if you were alive during the 80s when that run was happening, I would love to know what the immediate audience reaction was to something like that. I have to think he kind of had this niche support, because he's never had any long-running standalone Beta Ray Bill comic, and he just kind of has small appearances here and there. He's never been, like, a key player in any particular way. But the collective consciousness has come together that we want Bill Thor Horseman. Thor started a group of hammer bros, basically, that was called Thor Corpse. He was a part of that for a little while. He did a short stint with the Star Masters. Those are things that we're just probably never going to see in the MCU. It's weird to say because we've been proven wrong a, a thousand times now about what they're actually willing to put in these movies, but I'm, those are probably off the table. So instead, let's get into more specifics of key storylines with this character, and very specifically how they were first introduced. So because I've already brought it up, we know that he was specifically built, and how he was built, and the engineering and everything that went into that, but when he's first introduced in the comics, there is this stray spaceship that is going through Earth's galaxy's space. S.H.I.E.L.D. is aware of it, Fury asks Thor, hey bud, do you mind checking in on that and seeing what's going on? What's actually happening here is that Scuttlebutt, that sentient ship, has Beta Ray Bill in suspended animation inside, and it's guiding 
other Corbin refugee ships. Guiding and protecting, because if a threat is ever assessed, it'll activate Beta Ray Bill to defend them. Thor arriving on this ship activates Beta Ray Bill, and we have one of those classic superhero throwdowns thanks to a big misunderstanding. In the comics, Thor had a failsafe in Mjolnir that if he was separated from it for longer than 60 seconds, then it would turn back into its cane form, and he would turn back into human Donald Blake. I don't know precisely how that protects you. It seems like it screws you. But Bill was able to keep him from the hammer long enough that that happened, at which point I think he just kind of thumped him, knocked him out, and went, what's this cane? And picked it up, and, and picked it up. Sh he shouldn't have been able to do that. There's a crack of lightning and all that, and next thing he's all decked out like an Asgardian. That's why his costume is just like the same as Thor's. Odin actually kind of gets a sense that something's going on, and he, he teleports Milner and, and Thor using Bifrost to come back to Asgard, and it's this weird horse creature, and it's just kind of like, what's going on here? Odin being a, a wise and, and cool guy. <laughs> Rather than immediately outcasting Beta Ray Bill or wrestling the hammer away from him or anything like that, he recognizes that this is super significant. And by all rights, he separated the hammer from Thor, defeated Thor, and was still able to pick up the hammer. It should be his now. By nature of the hammer, Thor may no longer be worthy and Bill is more worthy. Odin doesn't want to make it quite that easy, doesn't want Thor to be totally screwed over, decides to set up a contest between them to the death to see who gets full control over the hammer. While the two are equals and it should have come to a stalemate, it is specifically set on this crazy lava world. Corbin, where the horse creature and Beta Ray are originally from, is an excessively hot planet. His physiology is completely built to endure that and work well in it, so it gives him an advantage over Thor. Beta Ray eventually wins, but also saves Thor from a lava pit, thinking he was too worthy of an opponent to let die like that. The point of the contest was to go battle to the death and he wouldn't let it happen. It's revealed that Odin probably gave him that advantage as a bit of a test. Given the opportunity, are you so power hungry that you would kill this guy that you don't know just to have his awesome weapon? Not only are you super strong and super dope, but you have this heart of gold, you're a very virtuous guy. You know what, dude? You get your own sick hammer. He orders that a weapon be crafted that is equal in power and might to Mjolnir. This is when Stormbreaker is forged, granting all the powers of Thor. So Beta Ray occasionally teams up with other people, most often he's helping the Asgardians, but his primary function and objective is to look after his own people, work on establishing new Corbin, but he eventually does leave that during Ragnarok to go and try and help the Asgardians. He's drawn by this combination of a sense of duty, as well as the Asgardian armor that he owns, and the origins of Stormbreaker. He's like, I gotta go there, I gotta help these people, they're, they're great people, and, I, and I'm powerful enough that I can do something. He actually kills Fenrir and saves a wounded Thor. Thor is obviously super grateful, but he's like, man, this isn't your fight and your people need you. I want you to live and carry on the legacy of the Asgardians if you don't make it, and he sends him back to Corbin. Honestly, his people aren't super stoked with him. He's been ditching them awful lately to go hang out with his super cool Asgardian friends. They're like, dude, we kind of made you with the whole point being that you're going to be like our sole protector. We need you. We're almost completely obliterated over here. So he has, he has at least one, I think multiple storylines where he starts vying for power with these other Corbinites trying to find out if someone else should have that mantle as the sole leader of the species. Those storylines are so specific and the characters like only exist for those little arcs and they're things that are only going to work if you did a solo Beta Ray Bill movie. Like 100% of the screen time and character development and everything would have to be committed to this character so I just don't think they're going to do it. I would have to dedicate way too much time into establishing and fully explaining all the different chess pieces that are going on there so it's easier to just say those solo adventures are few and far between and they don't contribute a whole lot to any larger narratives or storylines. At one point through a series of hijinks, he is cast into a human body, Simon Walters. In this human body, he actually teams up and helps Spider-Man defeat the villain Boar. It's a lame one-off villain. Stick him in the Sinister Six, that'll help round out those numbers. This storyline felt very boring to me. There's a few key things I really latched onto for this character, but I felt like I had less specific storylines and things that I enjoyed as much as I did for some of the other characters I've done these rundowns on. There's some pretty unexplored and unexplained consequences of this time in his life. This story thread leaves off with him basically sacrificing himself to go and fight these giant beasts in a different realm for all of eternity. It's like this ultimate sacrifice that he makes, and the next time we ever see the character, I don't know, he somehow got out of there and he's Beta Ray Bell again and not Simon Walters. So my interest in deeper research of that storyline and further explaining it is cut short by the fact that the writers like maybe didn't know how they were going to end it or just wanted to get to the next thing quickly and didn't feel like undoing it. So if they're skipping it, I'm skipping it. 
during Secret Invasion. There's the whole storyline with the evil Skrulls who were implanting themselves all over there, impersonating people like crazy. Beta Ray Bill shows up and everyone's like, he's a Skrull, we gotta do something about it. Thor basically chucks him a hammer and he's like, that, that's no Skrull. He catches the hammer, ah, oh, boom, he's, a Skrull couldn't do that, it's obviously Beta Ray Bill. They give each other a little bit of a wink and a nod and they're like, I knew. Big I told you so moment. But you know, his involvement with the rest of that doesn't, it's not that important. At some point, he fights a super scroll. I don't know, man, these particulars are not that interesting. I'm trying to get through the key story beats that have existed through this, this character's history, very specifically to get to his God Hunter storyline, because this is the coolest, best thing Beta Ray Bill has done since he first arrived on the scene. As should be clear from the other videos I've done in this style, I'm a bit of a sucker for storylines where characters have a breaking point, they become kind of corrupted, they start to turn away from their morals, things like that. I very much honed in on arcs with similar stakes and consequences in those other videos, and once again, it's my favorite part of Beta Ray Bill. Seemingly, the Corbinites have the worst luck. Their homeworld was destroyed by Surtur. Ah, uh, that's awful, that sucks. Happens to the best of them. Guess we'll go establish new Corbin. Nope, just kidding. That gets eaten by Galactus. At this point, Bill basically has to assume that the entirety of his species has been wiped out of the universe. Bill is driven absolutely insane by this. His sole purpose now becomes defeating Galactus. He knows he can't defeat Galactus in a fight, even with all his power and Stormbreaker and everything like this. Galactus eats planets. He's Horse Thor. He's probably out of his element a little bit. You're not one on one that. His insane plan where he becomes corrupted is he's going to map out the trajectory of Galactus, get to the planets before he does, and destroy them first in an effort to starve Galactus to death. He starts doing this. It's not like he gets interrupted. He starts destroying planets to stop Galactus. And at one point, the Silver Surfer shows up and he was like, I think this is a bad idea. You shouldn't do it. And he was like, I'm going to do what I want, Silver Surfer. For those previous planets, at the very least, he showed up and was like, guys, I'm destroying your planet. I'm trying to get back at Galactus. A little bit of revenge in my blood right now, but I need you guys to get off the planet because I'm nuking this. Pretty damn uncool, but at least he's not so twisted and heartless as to ignore these innocent lives, even if he's destroying their planets. He's doing it to stop an insane tyrant that eats planets and destroys millions and millions of lives. But eventually at one of these planets, the species that lives there says, no, we're going to stick it out. We're going to defend our planet. Thanks for the warning that this guy's coming. We're going to fight. Bill's like, guys, that is a fight you cannot win. That is a terrible decision. And they're like, at least it's our decision. So here's where he takes things too far. He unleashes a deadly virus across the entire planet and says, guys, get off and I have an antidote for you or stick it out and die needlessly before Galactus even gets here. This extremism and manipulation is where he loses his powers and can no longer wield Stormbreaker. Bill goes and hops over to some alien planets, acquires as much insane weaponry and tech as he can. He's still going to go blow up that planet, try and fight Galactus off as best he can. By the time he gets back, he finds that this planet has rallied and is fighting off Galactus, choosing to have stayed, knowing they're going to die either way, but maybe they can kill this thing in the process. In this moment of humanity, I think he realizes that he had made this decision for these people and that wasn't cool. He swoops in, stops them, rescues Galactus, and he has this realization that if he's the last Corbin, the legacy he is leaving for his entire species is this one of hatred, revenge, and bloodshed. In gratitude for all of this, Galactus actually scoops up the lost soul of a Corbin from somewhere in the universe and is able to create a partner for him, which becomes that Tai Asha Ra. In the process, through making the right decision, he also regains his control over Stormbreaker. But, you know, Galactus still kicks around and eats planets, but it's fine. Bill learned a, a lesson. That is the last specifically significant arc that we have from Bill that I'm going to cover. Now, how do you fit this into an MC movie, you ask? That is the fun part. I tried to do my best here to work within the constraints of, like, whatever 11 years of movies that we already have here. I think I have at least the outline of something. I'd love to hear what you guys think, if maybe you have a different spin on things. But really, I bet Marvel is going to go pretty nuts with this character if they use him, that they are not going to lean too heavily on the source material, because the movies are basically past a point where most of that can matter. His random one-off storylines and, and team-ups here and there don't really matter in the confines of, of the stories that are being told actively with Guardians 3, Thor 4, what have you. It especially doesn't matter when Surtur is already defeated. Galactus has not been established, they could potentially go that route. You know, Ragnarok has already happened, it's out of the picture. Odin's not going to be there to be like, hey, you two should battle to see who's the better Thor. Oh, we're going to craft you your own specific weapon. Well, Mjolnir's already gone, Stormbreaker's already in play, Odin's not there to make that happen, so a lot of that can't be in the movies. 
So specifically, I think that the origin of Surtur destroying his home planet should still be a part of the character, that it was something that he did sometime before Ragnarok. Thor either is or isn't aware of it. Beta Ray is going to show up in one of these movies. I've kind of pitched how it could work for Guardians 3 or Thor 4 as a fully fledged character with his own armor and look and everything. He's not going to have any of that Thor as Guardian ness to him yet. Two options they could go with here is that he was built in anticipation of a Surtur level threat and got plucked off onto Sakaar and had to fight his way off there by the time he became a champion and left. It was too late, Surtur had already done his thing. Or alternatively, he was made after the Surtur threat had happened, and just at some point he gets separated from his people, ends up on Sakaar, and no one can really help him. Either way, it doesn't matter, his planet has been destroyed, that is going to stay a big part of his origin. Now obviously this guy is going to have Surtur on his mind, he's probably going to be a little bit hungry for revenge, but maybe he is just getting off of Sakaar around the time that that starts to become important for the Asgardians. Maybe he just chooses to prioritize his people over the Asgardians, they haven't really helped each other in the past. It could, so it could be selfishness, duty to his people, a belief that Thor and the Asgardians can look after themselves, what have you. And maybe the news that Ragnarok had happened and Asgard had fallen a Surtur was enough for him to be like, I gotta go looking for this Thor guy. We clearly have some mutual enemies, we have the same need to help our people rebuild. It could be that he just barely missed helping out during Ragnarok, or was, you know, unaware it was happening, whatever was going on there. And when it finally came time that he was like, shit, I gotta either get over there and help, or I gotta follow up and help the Asgardians, we gotta do something, is when the snap happens, Beta Ray Bill is blipped. Now here we are at the very end of Endgame, he pops back into existence in the middle of his mission of I need to go find Thor. I know the way I outlined a lot of that is muddy, it really depends how they choose to place those events and the, the character's awareness of each other and the awareness of the different realms between each other. That's the sort of stuff we're going to get in like three lines of exposition. Not overly, overly important, just the idea that they have that origin and it's something that sets Beta Ray to go meet Thor. As was well established in Infinity War and Endgame, Thor doesn't really have a strong support system anymore. His closest friends are Hulk and Valkyrie at this point. Hulk has probably got his own stuff going on right now, Valkyrie's trying to run new Asgard. I would say Heimdall, Loki, Odin, and Hela are unlikely to appear, so the guy's kind of on his own. Giving him a new companion and potential friend to share the screen time with and kind of play off of would be great for this movie. Thor has lost so much here and it's time for him to find something new. Do you know what's a whole other interesting thing that they could do here is that they bring back in Lady Sif because it would be very interesting to catch up with that character. It's like an old friend. Thor's talking about all these people he's lost and just like forgot about Lady Sif. Maybe him and Bill meet up with her at some point. Hell, maybe Thor goes to meet up with her and Bill just happens to be there. They're like already a couple or already hanging out. Maybe, maybe there's a little something more going on there. I kind of made that decision on the fly, I didn't write that one down, but she should probably be in this movie. If for no other reason than to remind people and get them back on, oh my god, a cat just jumped in my lap. If for no other reason than to remind people and get uh, everyone more on board for this Lady Sif show, and hell, they're giving them these big budgets and everything, the CGI, you can have a CGI character, maybe Beta Ray's there, maybe that's too many partner and couple movies. We already have Falcon and Winter Soldier, we already have WandaVision, maybe one, one that's a little more solo, Loki style, but I don't know. Anyways, I didn't put a lot of thought into that one prior to write this second, but she should probably be in the movie to some extent. So at this point we have two equally powered guys who are both decked out in this Asgardian armor. They both have crazy awesome hammer weapons. Their home worlds are both destroyed by Surtur. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep! I think there's similarly a lot of uh, room there for like a funny interplay. Thor's kind of jealous. He doesn't want to relinquish being like the very strong, most powerful Avenger. He doesn't like having his power and position questioned. Specifically also not by someone who is like the same as him with a horse face. When they meet, Bill wants to help in any way he can. He wants to help rebuild, do whatever there is. But along the way, he has also caught wind of a new potential threat that could be a risk to all of them. Or it could be something very specifically targeting new Asgard or new Corbin, but either way they have this immediate bond over their joined fates. There's this compulsion to work together, they can relate to each other in a way that Thor has been missing for a while now. Perhaps new Asgard is more well equipped than new Corbin is, they're like barely getting by. So they actually pop over to Earth and they can outfit him in something that is very similar to what Thor wears. I would say if you're going to do an entire movie of the two of them hanging out, you do some different color splashes, a few differences. Maybe we give Beta Ray the winged helm. 
You can have some sort of something in there about how he really likes it and thinks it like fits well and he thinks it's like super practical or something and Thor can joke about how he always hated the helmet and he's not going to wear it. Just visually distinct costumes on top of him being a horse versus a human. The threat does not have to be Galactus, but it absolutely could be. It's just that when you establish something like Galactus, you're kind of setting up something very, very large, and I imagine they're going to want to steer clear of very, very large for a little while. So instead, we just have an enemy that hates Corbinites and is going to work to wipe out the Corbins. Throughout the movie, these two are going to chum it up, they're going to become good pals, but when we're getting later on in the movie, Thor begins to realize that Beta is maybe a bit unstable and has some pretty extreme motives that he's asking for help with. If it's not something as large scale as destroying planets to stop Galactus from eating planets and starving him, it could be something like destroying an entire planet because that's where the base of his enemies are. Thor has been through this shit. He has lost his homeworld, he has lost half the universe, but he also very actively wanted to wipe out the Frost Giants and realize that's like beyond his role and that's not the sort of stuff he should be doing. The two could argue, the two could fight, it could take place on a hot planet, hot environment, something like that, where he is able to overpower Thor. Now, presumably at this point in his life with his insane motives, he is not going to be worthy, he's not going to pick up Stormbreaker, because in the climax of the movie, in the moment when Bill is doing this fighting, when he's trying to destroy this other species and this planet, he instead makes the sacrifice play in order to save a bunch of innocents. Either he finds this humanity within this other species and realizes that they are also worth saving, or he makes the sacrifice in order to save his own people, it doesn't really matter. But he's like totally wiped out death's door. We can have an exact mirror of the scene where Odin is on Asgard, whispering the powers into Mjolnir and sending it to Thor to save him and have him rally up strong. We can have Thor passing off Stormbreaker in the exact same way, seeing that Beta Ray is the type of guy he should have as an ally. From there, the two can save the day together, whatever needs to be done there, taking massive shortcuts with actual plot details. And where it goes from there is going to totally depend on how Marvel envisions moving forward with more Thor or more Beta Ray Bill, if, if any, if more than zero. But Thor can either take back Stormbreaker and we can have its own separate thing where Beta Ray gets his own weapon, maybe becomes a little bit more of his own character, a little bit less Thor-like, but they're still like, still good buds. Or it could be a legit passing of the torch. Thor has found a successor. Maybe his heart's not in it the way it used to be, he's aging out of things a little bit, he's been through a lot of emotional and mental trauma. Here is someone who was genetically and cybernetically built to be a good guy and a protector. He's very strong, he's going to be around for a very, very long time. Maybe he's the type of guy you want having that power. So yeah, I specifically want him introduced, having that shared background of homeworld destroyed by Surtur. I want him to fill this void of Thor not having any friends or any confidants or anything in his life. He's putting himself back out there, he's trying to like be a hero again. Bill kind of is like the co-lead but also the villain for a short while. Thor has to actively fight and stop him. They come together at the end to defeat some nameless threat. It honestly doesn't really matter what it is because the entirety of the movie should be about the cool dynamic between the two of them, Thor moving on to an extent, Thor making a friend, and possibly him passing the torch. I wish I had more specifics to pen into that little arc there. But honestly, reading up on the existing storylines and everything that Beta Ray Bill has, I wasn't that intrigued by a lot of them. So either something like this, I think that could work very well. I think it probably needs some tweaking to make sure it remains a Thor movie. I've, I've probably made it too much of a Bill movie, but this is a, a Bill video. But honestly, Marvel can do anything with this character because the storylines aren't that exciting. I think the concept of the character is way more interesting than any individual story. So there is a lot of breathing room to do fun things. And between the Eternals and Shang-Chi, that seems to be kind of what Marvel's really into these days. A sandbox character that's plucked out of like the F list that you can do whatever the hell you want with them. I realize this video was way more me just talking about things I like about the character and my, my dream version of it and my movie idea or whatever. I'll try to make that clear in the video title in some way. When a big chunk of the video describing powers and origins and everything can be replaced with Horse Thor, that's the route I'm going to go, but it also means that portion of the video is going to be a little bit light on specifics and content. So yeah, hopefully that's still, hopefully that's, you guys still enjoyed this. I enjoyed the research. I got myself all psyched for SDCC coming up on the 20th here because I want to know more. And I got myself all psyched up and convinced that we will see Beta Ray Bill, even though we don't know that. In my heart, I feel it. And that counts for something. <laughs> Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. Please let me know down below what you think of the character, how you'd like to see them be introduced, what role they should play, anything and everything, I'd love to talk about it. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you again soon.